we'll go ahead and have a seat. Again, it's good to be here with you, and I know I just did, but I want to extend another welcome to you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to start off this morning. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we also have Bibles during, uh, over by our Next Steps table. Uh, that's our gift to you today, so please uh, grab one of those before you leave if you don't have one. Uh, but we're just so excited this morning to be continuing our series called Family Matters. This is the second uh, week of a five-week series where we're talking about family. And the name, uh, as many of you have probably figured out, is derived from the 90s sitcom Family Matters. Who grew up watching Family Matters? All right, most of us. Who's never watched an episode of Family Matters? Okay, now we know how to pray for each other and... Uh, for the rest of our time, we're just going to watch some episodes. No, I wish. But uh, uh, Family Matters was a, a show in the late 80s and, and the 90s on the legendary uh, TGIF lineup on ABC in the late 80s and, and 90s, along with Full House and later Boy Meets World and some of the other uh, great shows. And it was one of my favorite shows growing up. And I actually wanted to uh, recreate the intro, the Family Matters intro, with some people from our church. But... Uh, we ran out of time, and so I figured for now I'd just Photoshop my family onto the poster because uh, sometimes it felt like growing up that our family could be starring in the sitcom. And so, uh, But we'll talk a little bit more about the show itself towards the end of the series. But uh, the title of the show, Family Matters, is uh, one that I always found fascinating because the word matters in Family Matters, it, it carries with it a, a dual meaning, right? Like the word matters can either be a noun, in which case the title suggests that the show is about matters having to do with family, or the word matters could be a verb, in which case the title carries uh, an implicit it with us, reminding us that family itself actually matters. Whatever way you take the title, and I do think it was intended to be taken both ways, the reality of our cultural age is that family is not only being redefined, but family does not matter in the same way that it used to matter in the hearts of many. And therefore, family matters are hardly discussed in ways that challenge preconceived notions of our day, and as a result, families today hardly resemble the families like seen in shows like Family Matters. Now, I'm not saying all this to say that, you know, we need to go back to having shows that exemplify morality on the screen, like Family Matters, or earlier shows like Little House on the Prairie, and, you know, I love all those shows, but uh, they hold a special place in my heart. But number one, I don't think those shows were necessarily perfect in their depictions of families either. You know, it's easy for us to, to idolize and glorify the past shows while looking at them through the lenses of our current cultural glasses. But if we were to look at these shows through the lenses of Scripture alone, then we might find some fault in those shows as well. So let's not be so quick to put older shows on some sort of pedestal. But I think it's important for us to realize uh, that, that art shapes culture just as much as culture shapes art. And so while we long for shows and movies with moralistic undertones that align with all the truths of Scripture, we must realize that, that shows that are grounded in morality cannot and will not on their own reverse the course that our culture seems to be headed. Why? Well, Romans 1 gives us an insight not only to where our culture is headed, but where our culture is today. The ending of Romans chapter 1 in particular, I think it is a, is a microcosm of our current society. And, and if this is your first time with us, or maybe even your first time in church, I, I don't want to seem like I'm standing up here with a judgmental attitude towards our culture or like I'm speaking from a position of moral su su superiority. No, this is just a fact that's told to us in the book of Romans. So let's look at Romans chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 18, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. Uh, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I think this is a little bit more clear, uh, but the words should be on the screen behind me in the English Standard Version. And I think when possible, it's important for you to, to be looking at your Bible or looking at uh, the words on or your screen if you have the Bible app. I, I just think it's uh, important that you realize I'm not just making this up. I'm not just sharing my opinion on the world. Uh, but we're reading, uh, to use the Latin, the, the verbum Dei, or the, the words of God, not the words of man. 
And so uh, let me read Romans 1, starting in verse 18, talking about our current day today. So verse 18 of Romans 1. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Okay, so what is Paul, the author here, what's he saying? Well, he's saying the same thing that the psalmist says in Psalm 19, that the, the heavens themselves declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim God's handiwork. So people are without excuse because they can just look at the creation and, and see the complexity and the intricacy of, of the design all around of us and realize that the design points to a designer. And so unbelievers are without an excuse as to why they remain in their unbelief. Why do they remain in their unbelief? Verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they in instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Okay, the English Standard Version says they, they, that the people exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So what happened? Verse 24. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did file, vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Verse 26, this is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. The men, instead of having natural sexual relations with women, burned with lust for one another. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of their sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that, that should never be done. The, the Greek phrase here that's translated as, as the penalty they deserved, or uh, the ESV, the due penalty, uh, that, that literally means the necessary retribution. And so what we see here is that God gives people over to their sins, and when he does that, then they're met with the appropriate justice, and the appropriate justice is being given over to their sins. Like, like, really, that's, that's a heartbreaking verse. And we're not dwelling on this verse in particular long, but, but you know, may, may God protect any of us from ever being given over to our sin. And look at what happens in verse 29. As a result of being given over to their sin, their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. That, that, that phrase is just fascinating to me, inventing new ways of sinning. I mean, it's kind of a sidetrack, but uh, I saw an article this week that was talking about how uh, kids that are in preschool right now, uh, and I think it said like 70% of kids who are in preschool right now will have jobs that don't even exist yet. Like that just blows my mind. You can't even comprehend what that means. Our daughter's in preschool, and so the jobs don't exist yet. You can't imagine what they might be doing. Well, here it says that people are, are inventing new ways of sinning. So the people will continue to invent new ways of sinning that don't exist today. The ESV uses the phrase inventors of evil. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless and have no mercy. That phrase refuse to understand is interesting. That just jumped out to me. I think that's the root of a lot of the problems we see in our world today. And then the last verse, verse 32, they know God's justice requires that those who do things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them. Okay, so, so that's a, a long passage, but the reason why I read that whole passage is to show that that is indeed a microcosm of our culture. And the culture, if, if it's true that culture shapes art, which I believe it is, then even though art can and does also shape culture, 
then we have to realize that TV shows and movies that are grounded in biblical truths cannot and will not on their own reverse the course that the culture is headed. Now, I don't say that as a lament. I don't say that as a eulogy for our day, but as a challenge. Because if it is true that we're living in a Romans 1 culture, then number one, we must become diligent in recognizing the subliminal uh, culture messages written into shows and movies that we watch. And second of all, we have to ground ourselves deeply in the Word of God first and foremost, not, not only so that we won't be swept away by the worldly Romans 1 culture of our day, but so that our lives can be a show that the world watches and says there's something different about him or there's something different about her and our lives themselves become beacons of morality. That in our lives can become aqueducts, if you will, that the Holy Spirit uses to draw people to himself. Which brings us to our current study on family, which last week I said uh, was really a study on Colossians 3. Because Colossians 3, if you remember from last week, in this letter, Paul is writing to the church in Colossae that is wrestling with the weight of, of trying to avoid falling into false teaching that's pressuring them from the outside. And while they haven't compromised in their faith yet, they're trying to remain faithful in the midst of the philosophical and the moral pressures from outside of the church. And so Paul spends the first half of this book reminding them of the sufficiency of Scripture, that, that all they need is faith in Christ alone, their salvation is found in Christ alone. And then now here in chapter 3, in the second half of the book, he turns to remind them how they should live in the midst of the worldly culture that they find themselves in. And so while I told you that this is a series called uh, Family Matters, and it could be called Colossians 3, and we were going to be in Colossians 3 each week, and your bulletins actually say Colossians 3, uh, we're actually going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 today. Because uh, Ephesians chapter 5, or uh, the book of Ephesians, is really almost an identical book to the book of Colossians. In, in fact, many skeptics get all hung up on, on how close these, these uh, books are, that they say, look, someone must have copied Paul. There's no way that this was also written by Paul. And to that, I just want to be like, you know, have you ever copied a text message that you sent to someone and you sent the same thing to, to someone else? Right, that's kind of what Paul's doing. There's problems in the church in Ephesus, and there's problems in the church in Colossae, and there's similar problems, so he uses the similar t uh, terminology as he writes these books. And, and actually, in uh, Ephesians, he actually expounds on uh, some things from Colossians a little bit more. And so what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 22, uh, it parallels what he says at the end of Colossians 3, but it expounds on it a little bit more. So here's what it says. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. All right, so this is the expanded version of Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 3. And for the rest of our time together, I want to unpack uh, what all of this means. Okay, what, what is Paul's motivation in writing these words, aside from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? What, what is he drawing on uh, as, as he writes this? And so uh, to answer that question, we're going to spend pretty much the rest of our time in the book of Genesis. Okay, so we went from Romans to Colossians to Ephesians. Now we're going to Genesis chapter 1, and that'll eventually get us to talking about marriage. So if you're lost already, here's our outline on the screen, and hopefully this will, will help. 
Uh, what I want to do for the rest of our time together is look at how God designed us as men and women. So, so what is our calling? And then we'll talk briefly about the curse that was caused by man and given by God. And then hopefully uh, we'll get to our final point, the cure. And through all of this, uh, we'll see not only why marriage matters, but uh, you know, we'll hopefully see how difficult marriage matters can be addressed and solved. Okay, so the calling, the curse, and the cure, that's our outline today. And we're going to spend the vast majority of our time in the first point, the calling. And so with that said, uh, yeah, if your Bible's open to Genesis 1, probably the first page in most of our Bibles, Genesis 1, verse 1, as we look at the calling, how did God design men and women? And, and if you're still turning there, actually, while you're turning there, let me just say, you know, I, I reference a lot of books and even a lot of speakers and, and sermons, but this time I want to give you uh, an entire sermon series. Uh, this is a, a priceless resource. This, this message today and the message in a couple weeks when we talk about dating and singleness is largely influenced uh, first and foremost by scripture, but uh, by this sermon series that my former pastor in, in Dallas, Matt Chandler, a uh, 10-part sermon series that he did uh, called A Beautiful Design. Uh, this series is free on YouTube, and it, it was, I think, about seven years ago, but it could not be more timely for us in the day that we live in. And so you'll see it, uh, Matt Chandler quoted a few times in this message, but I could not recommend this sermon series enough. So you can find the playlist on YouTube. If you're watching the sermon-only video later, uh, then it'll be in the description of that video. But Genesis 1, verse 1, a verse that probably most of us know by heart. Actually, let's read the words together. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This, this is a verse that the, the, the French theologian Francis Schaeffer said that this verse is the most pregnant sentence ever written. In other words, uh, this, this, there's just so much packed into these 10 words. In these 10 words, you can find the answer to, to every scientific theory that can be hypothesized. Every mathematic equation that can ever be solved, every philosophical inquiry that can be raised, every epistemological and metaphysical conundrum that can be solved, all of it is packed into this verse because if God is the creator and the sustainer of everything everywhere throughout all of time and history, then that means that he has the answers to every question that can possibly be asked. And so, so, so often, I think we skip over Genesis 1-1 because we've heard it so many times, but what, what Schaefer is saying is that the sentence is so full of meaning and implications for us, not only because it defines our origins and the, and the origins of creation, but because it explains why we exist. This is why the first question of the Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief end of man to glorify God and serve him forever? Yet so many of us, often go through life looking for God to serve us. Or we want to make ourselves the main character in our story. But the first chapter of the Bible makes it clear that we serve a God who created the whole world, who spoke light into existence, who spoke the, st the seas and, and, and the stars and the dry land and the planets into existence and the animals and the birds and the reptiles and the moons, all of it, he just spoke into existence. And then at the end of chapter 1, he just makes man out of the dust of the earth. Like, like not even the clay of the earth, not the dirt of the earth, but the dust of the earth. Like the stuff you wipe off the TV when you're looking for the remote or something like that. He made man out of the dust. And yet some reason we think that we're the main characters of our life. And, and even more, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but we have the audacity to get offended and to question God when we come to parts of scripture that we don't like. We think we can fit God into our 21st century box and challenge him and his claims of what he says are right and wrong. But no, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We are not the main characters in our story. But that's the rallying cry of our culture, isn't it? That it's all about us. It's certainly the cry of, of Elsa from Frozen, if you know that song. I know I listen to that song about 10 million times a day. But you know the song, it's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. There's no right, no wrong, no rules for me, because I'm free. Or what about The Greatest Showman, the song with the bearded woman? I forget what it's called, but she says, uh, look out, because here I come, I'm searching, I'm marching out 
I'm marching to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. That's the name of the song. This is me. Now, I'm not trying to advocate for, you know, canceling movies or, or networks. I love Frozen. The first one, the second one, has major plot holes. That's a hill I'm willing to die on. Uh, but but uh, our daughter loves Elsa, and she dresses up from Frozen, and I love The Greatest Showman. In fact, we're trying to host a movie night uh, in the fall, Lord willing, in partnership with the rec center, and uh, so, so hopefully we might show The Greatest Showman. So I'm not bringing these up saying, hey, don't watch any of these movies. No, I'm just bringing it up to show that those are just two small examples of the fact that we have to become diligent in recognizing the subliminal cultural messages that are written into movies and shows. See, every show and every film is trying to teach us something, and the dominant narrative in the shows and movies is what we talked about last week, and that's therapeutic, moralistic deism. That there might be a god or gods, but their desire is for us to, to be happy and, and uh, you know, without any attention to given uh, to the commands of God. I mean, of course, we follow the big ones, like don't murder people and try not to lie, and, and you know, you probably shouldn't commit adultery, but ultimately, you do you. Right? That's the rallying cry of our culture. As long as you don't hurt anybody else, you do it. You only have one life to live. But brothers and sisters, the first verse of the Bible shows us that we're not the main characters in our story, that God is the main character in our story, and therefore our main purpose in life is, to, is not to do whatever we see best, but to do what God says is best. And when we do that, then we bring glory to him. And like we talked about last week, when we bring glory to God, that's the actual key to maximizing our own happiness and satisfaction because, to quote John Piper, God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. And his designing doesn't stop in the first verse of the Bible because look at the end of chapter 1, Genesis 1, verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so God created men uh, and women to co-reign over creation as image bearers of God across the earth. Male and female, he created them to do what? To be fruitful and multiply. To, to fulfill the earth and to subdue it and to have dominion over it. That's the, the, the purpose of mankind. Like that's the meaning of life, that we're created to be image bearers. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that, that we're, there's something that separates us as humans from the rest of creation. We're not just, just mammals that, you know, are trying to figure out how to stay on top of the food chain, but there's something innately about us that separates us from the rest of the world. And, and this should be obvious to us, and, and I'm sorry in advance for, for the morbid example here, but if, if there's a house fire and you, you have a pet dog in the house, and there's a person in the house, even if it's someone that you don't like or someone that you don't think really contributes to society, if there's a dog and there's a person in the house and you can only save one, it's a no-brainer that at, whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, you should save the person, right? And, and, and that should be universally agreed on whether it's a Jesus follower or a Jesus hater. Deep down, we know this to be true because we're made in the image of God. The theological term for this is the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei. That's the core Christian doctrine that humanity is unique among all of creation, was fashioned by God in his own likeness, and uniquely given the responsibility by God to reign and rule the earth as his representatives. Okay? So, so the image of God doesn't mean that God has, you know, ten fingers and ten toes, or, or that he looks physically like us, or that we look physically like him. But no, we're made in the image of God in the sense that unlike the rest of the creation, we have intellect and freedom and the capacity to make high-level moral decisions and we can write laws and fall deeply in love and govern well and all of that separates us from the rest of creation. And while we don't have time to dwell on it now, I think a right understanding of the Imago Dei 
mixed with a true right understanding of our position before God should solve about 99% of the world's problems. Racism, pornography, sex trafficking, most wars, physical, mental, verbal abuse, social media hostility. Right? If we truly saw every human as a, as a unique handcrafted creation of the Most High God, then how can we possibly treat anybody less? Uh, Ada, our daughter, uh, turned five this past week. And one of the birthday gifts that she got, uh, she had a tea party, birthday party, and so she got an actual teacup with a, uh, and it was a, a nice plate. And so we've been trying to teach her all week, you know, you can't play with this like you play with the rest of your toys, because if you play with it too rough, it's going to break. I was going to bring it here as an illustration, but I'd probably break it on accident and it's on camera, and then she'd know. But what we need to realize is that even the smallest, poorest, most unknown child who may not seem to contribute anything to the world at all is more valuable than the finest, most expensive piece of china. And I think a lot of us are okay with that sentence, but, but this also means that even the most vile, evil, cruel murderer on death row, as long as there's breath in their lungs, because they're made in the image of God, they too are more valuable than even the most, it- the most expensive item in the world. And here's the crazy thing. Even the most staunch atheist would have to admit that that this biblical principle, that that when we're made in the image of God, there's intrinsic value to humanity. Uh, Even even the most staunch atheist would have to admit that that statement is the launching pad from which all Western standards of morality take flight. I don't like to uh, quote Friedrich Nietzsche very often. He, of course, is the German philosophy whose most famous statement was God is dead and now he's dead, uh, but, but uh, his, his work uh, influenced Hitler, and he once said, again, he's no fan of Christianity, this is what he said, he said, another Christian concept, but one less cra- no less crazy, so again, he, he doesn't like this, is the concept of the equality of souls before God. This concept furnished the prototype of all theory of equal rights. Like, imagine how hard that must have been for him to write, to realize, uh, I'm completely against this Christianity thing, but even I can't argue that This is the standard from which all morality flows. See, when our view of humanity is elevated, not above God, but above creation, when we realize that we're not the main characters in our story, but we're all made in the imago Dei, the image of God, then number one, we realize that we all have innate value, right? That all of us, each and every one of us, is special in the eyes of God and valuable and loved by him. Number two, we realize that there are no hierarchical rankings in God's economy when it comes to value, right? The priest is on par with the pauper. The beggar is on par with the business CEO. But we also realize that when we take the Imago Dei seriously, that we have to take the the unique responsibilities that God has given us as men and women seriously as well. Okay, now this is where a lot of people get off the boat. Right? It's easy for us to say, okay, God made us above the animals. God made us rulers of the earth. Let's, let's do this. Until we realize that we've been given specific and unique roles to play as men and women. And suddenly, uh, when, when we look at our calling as men and, and, and women, equal in value and yet distinct in the role that we play as co-reigners of the earth, well, here's what happens. None of us like it. Because for both men and women, the calling is, is tough, and I think the reason that this teaching is so unpopular is because uh, it's so difficult, and because the teaching has been mistaught in the past. And so what I want to do as we finish the calling portion of our message, I told you this was the longest one by far, the other will be uh, pretty quick, is I, w- I want to throw out two words that might immediately cause some of you to, to shrivel up and tune out the rest of the message. But these are two words that are taught in the Bible and, and, and help us understand the distinct role that God has given men and women. These, ro- these words, uh, since they're part of Scripture, even if they make us uncomfortable, they're equally inspired by God. And so we've got to dive into them boldless, reg- boldly, regardless of what pressure there is from outside or even inside the church. And here they are, these two words, headship and helper. Headship and helper. And if either or both of those words sound archaic or cause you to to feel offense, well, let's look at where they are in Scripture. So if your Bible's still open to Genesis 1, 
Look at the very next chapter, which is probably the very next page in your Bible, Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 15. Genesis 1 gave us the, the more broad account of the creation narrative, and here in Genesis 2, uh, it zooms in closer on the creation of mankind. And so uh, Genesis 2.15, picking up there, God had just created Adam, the, the man, Adam, and look at what it says. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, so, so Adam is given the command, he's given the responsibility to keep the law, to work and keep the garden. And look what it says in verse 8, or 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up in, his, uh, in its place with flesh. And the ribs that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay, so, so let's start with the man and, the, and this word headship. This, this word headship is not used here in this passage in Genesis, but it's seen throughout. And I didn't just make up this word because we read it in Ephesians chapter 5 where it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Okay? This is a, a, an uncomfortable text when we don't look at what it means, and it's even more uncomfortable when we look at it apart from what we just talked about, about how we're all made in the image of God. Right, that men and women are created in the image of God, which means that we are all equal when it comes to our value and our worth and our dignity before God. And so that means the verse in Ephesians chapter 5 cannot be saying, it's not trying to distinguish, uh, as it's distinguishing roles between men and women, and specifically saying that the husband is the head of the wife, that's not saying, and this is so important for us to get, this is not saying, neither in Genesis 2 or in Ephesians 5, it's not creating some sort of over-under hierarchy in which men are elite and women are subservient. Okay, that's a, a sinful, evil, wicked twisting of the scriptures, and God will deal harshly with any man who uses the word of God to belittle or oppress or abuse his daughters. But no, a different picture of headship is painted in Genesis 2 as the calling of man is seen as both sacrificial and bearing of all responsibility. Okay, so God gave Adam the responsibility to lead and to rule and sub to, to subdue and to not eat from the tree in the garden. Well, spoiler alert, what happens in Genesis chapter 3? The fall of man, they eat from the tree in the garden. Who's the one that God comes after immediately? Right, Eve was the one who ate from the fruit first. But who does God show up looking for? We'll turn one page over, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Okay, this is, this is after they had eaten from the tree. You know, if you have kids, you know, when they're being real quiet, there's probably something going on, and you start looking for them, and they're running away the other way. Like, that's kind of what's going on here. They, they hear God coming to find them, and it says the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the, the trees of the garden. Like, that's just a ridiculous statement. He created everything. He knows everything, and they're hiding. It kind of reminds me of Jonah, but that's a whole other sermon. Verse 9, but the Lord God called to, to who? Who did he call out to? The man. And said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sounds of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11, God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Then Adam fails in his role. He fails to take responsibility and cowardly throws his wife under the bus. 
But what's interesting is that when you get to the New Testament in Romans chapter 5, the, 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 the writers of the letters in the New Testament cast all of the blame for the fall of humanity on Adam. Romans chapter 5, I'll read these verses really quick. Romans 5, 12, it says, Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. Verse 14, death reigned from the time of Adam, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did. Many died by the trespass of the one man. By the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. Through the disobedience of the one man, many were made sinners. So, so the Bible shows us that it was Adam, it, it wasn't Eve, who sinned before God and brought death to all of mankind. And the reason is because of his position of headship, not more value, but more responsibility to lead in the way of God, even over Eve. I think a good definition of headship comes from that beautiful design series that I mentioned. Here it is. Headship is the unique God-given leadership of the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. God tasked Adam with the responsibility to rule and reign. And not, not to reign over his wife, but over the creation, and he failed. And unfortunately, men fail in their role in the family as leaders and as church leaders every day. But the studies are, are clear, both in the church and outside the church, that men who abdicate their God-given role as spiritual leaders in the house, when that happens, that's the recipe for societal collapse. Now, we can't go there without an aside for our single mothers and, and widows. You know, all throughout church history and all throughout the Bible, it's seen over and over again that to quote uh, Matt Chandler, where the ideal is lacking, grace abounds. Right? God seems to have a special ear to the earnest prayers of mothers. Where the ideal is lacking, grace abounds. But, you know, please don't hear what I'm not saying. But I'm speaking right now specifically to the men in the room, both the husbands and the fathers in the room. We'll get to singleness in a couple weeks. But those of you who are married or fathers know that the responsibility for the spiritual climate of your home doesn't fall on me. It doesn't fall on the chapel kids leaders or our student ministry leaders. It falls on you. And just like one day I will stand before God and give an account for every single word that comes out of my mouth from this pulpit, I will also stand before God, and so will you husbands and fathers, and give an account for how we led our wives and our children spiritually. And there's room for grace. I don't want you leaving today with a, a hopeless feeling, feeling like a failure. Right? There's room for grace, and I need it just as much as you all do. You know, please don't you know, ever romanticize my family just because we're you know, the pastor's family. We mess up on a daily basis. It's a struggle for us to have family devotions at night. I don't always step into that role of spiritual leader in our house. Amanda and I, we, we weren't on the same page at the beginning of this week, right? The relational temperature was heating up a little bit in our house, and, and I had to first apologize to the Lord and then apologize to Amanda and say, you know, I haven't been leading our family this week the way I should. She didn't snap at me and say, you said the same thing last week. I know she showed grace and she helped me, you know, look at our schedule and see how we could rearrange things so that our family could be in a better spot where I could lead better. Which leads to the second hot button word, helper. See, God knew that Adam, the, the man, would need help. And that's why we're told in verse 18 of chapter 2 that Adam needed a helper. Now, now immediately for many of us, there's baggage with that word. And I've never fully understood why, because you know who's called the helper, that the Hebrew word is azar, and, and you know who's that word azar is used for in the Old Testament more than anyone else is for God. Okay, the word azar is used 21 times in the Old Testament. Two are used for the woman being the helper for the man. There's two other uses, and then 17 times it's used to talk about God and his relationship with his people. Let me just give you one example. Psalm 33, 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. He is our help. That's the same word that's used to describe Eve. Like, does that seem like some subservient, helpless, you should be seen but not heard kind of, kind of helper that's usually associated with the word helper? Now, when I read that psalm, the image in my mind is like the Avengers showing up, right? 
Now, the only difference in that situation where the word ezar is, is used or where the word helper is used, it's used to designate uh, that, that the, the one helping, they're helping the one who's designated with the primary responsibility, right? The, the helper is the one helping the one who's been tasked with the primary responsibility, but that in no way signifies that the helper is weaker than the one being helped. In fact, the opposite is often true. But here's an illustration that I think is helpful. This is another one from that beautiful design series. If I'm in my office uh, at the chapel in Akron, we just recently got uh, a, an office for all the Saturate campuses. Our Nordonia campus pretty much took over the whole thing. And so let's say I'm in that office and, and I see Nick over at his desk. And so I go up to Nick and I say, hey, Nick, can you help me with this? Right? Maybe it's to, uh, you know, figure out the length of a sermon series or or to take a picture of them to make another cardboard cutout or something like that. Like, like I go up and I say, can, can I help you with this? When I ask Nick for help, I'm not asking him to do his job. I'm asking him to do something that I've been tasked with that I'm too weak to do on my own. And so his strength isn't lessened in being my helper for the task. In fact, I, as the one who am being helped, is, is the weaker one who needs help in order to fulfill the primary responsibility. So says Matt Chandler, he says this, he says, although to be a helper is not inherently inferior, it is to come alongside the one with the primary responsibility. To say that a woman who is helping is somehow inferior to the one with the primary responsibility is to make the accusation that God is inferior for the help that he gives his children. Genesis says she is a helper fit for him, not a helper like him, but a helper fit for him. See, this phrase, fit for him, brings us back to, to our final point, the cure. Okay, so, so call, the calling, men and women are equal uh, in value, yet distinct in role. The curse is that men has abdicated, we've abdicated our position of leadership. And ladies, you aren't completely off the hook. We'll talk about you all in a couple weeks. But the cure is this, and this is really our main point, which brings us back to marriage. And warning, this is a, a grammatically incorrect run-on sentence, but I couldn't figure out how to condense it. When men and women both humbly embrace the idea that they both were created unique by God in the image of God and they are equal in dignity, value, and worth and have been created to complement each other, like not complement like, uh, you know, just say nice things to each other, but in the sense of completing each other. When men and women humbly realize they have both been created to complement each other, not compete against each other, then the strengths of the one are made even stronger by the strengths of the other, and the entire family flourishes. Okay, this is what's called a complementarian relationship in the home. When men are men and women are women, not just biologically, but in embracing their God-given roles, humbly laying down their own desires and their wants so that the joy of the other might increase, and so that God's glory might be seen as brighter, and so that all of our hearts can be satisfied in him. You say, can't I just do that without all the complementarian headship and helper stuff? Like, can't we just sacrificially live, uh, you know, for each other? Well, this brings us back to Ephesians, and with this, we'll land the plane. You don't have to turn back there. I'll just read it. Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands. As to who? As to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and, his, and, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, we have to pause there. This phrase that wives should submit to everything uh, uh, to their husbands, this is not the Scripture tolerating abuse. Okay, we'll come back to this in two weeks, but we, we, we can't go past that without saying this is not the Scripture tolerating abuse. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So, so what is Paul doing here as he's using this illustration of marriage? Well, he ties it all together in verse 32. He says, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Okay, so Paul is using this illustration of marriage to talk about Jesus and the church. Brothers and sisters, a complementarian view of marriage, and that's what this is. It's not an archaic, oppressive, misogynistic, belittling view but it's a view that reflects the complementary truth about Jesus and the church. I read an article this week by a lady named Mary uh, Cassian. 
She's the author and professor. Uh, she's an author and she's a professor at Southwestern Seminary. Here's what she says, kind of a lengthy quote. If you hear someone tell you that the complementary, that, that complementarity means that you have to get married, have to have dozens of babies, be a stay-at-home housewife, clean toilets, completely forgo a career, chuck your brain, tolerate abuse, watch Leave It to Beaver reruns, bury your gifts, deny your personality, and bobblehead nod yes to everything men say, don't believe it. Okay, a complementarian is a person who believes that God created male and female to reflect complementary truths about Jesus. Let me read that sentence again. A complementarian is a person who believes that God created male and God created female to reflect the complementary truths about Jesus. She says, we believe that males were designed to shine the spotlight on Christ's relationship to the church and, Lord, and the Lord God's relationship to Christ in a way that females cannot. And females were designed to shine the spotlight on the church's relationship to Christ and Christ's relationship to the Lord God in a way that males cannot. And then she adds, who we are as male and female is ultimately not about us. It's about testifying to the story of Jesus. We do not get to dictate what manhood and womanhood are all about. Our creator does. That's the basis of complementarianism. And I would add that that's the basis of what it means to be a Christian. Right, that we don't dictate what we want to believe. We, we simply believe what God has explicitly revealed to us in his word. And what he's revealed to us about marriage is that we are equal uh, yet distinct. And when we embrace that truth, and when men don't abdicate their responsibility as spiritual leaders in the home, and women realize that God have created them to come alongside the man in a, in, in a unique but equally important role, so that men and women can co-rule and reign over creation, that's when the family flourishes. Well, as our band comes back up and we prepare to sing our final song, let me close with this story, another lengthy quote here by writer Rebecca McLaughlin. We've quoted her several times in the past, but I think this may help clear any confusion, maybe even any frustration about what we've been talking about today. Here's what she writes. She says, I was an undergraduate at Cambridge University when I first grappled with Ephesians 5.22. I'd come from an academically driven, equally oriented, single-sex high school, and I was repulsed. Wives submit to your husband as to the Lord? You've got to be kidding me. She says, I had three major problems with this verse. The first was the premise that wives should submit. I knew women who are just as competent as men, often more so. If there's wisdom in asymmetrical decision-making in marriage, I thought surely it would depend on who was more competent in the area. Sometimes the husband, sometimes the wife. The second was the idea that wives should submit to their husbands as to the Lord. She says it's one thing submitting to Jesus, the self-sacrificing king of the universe. It's quite another to submit to a, a flawed, sinful man, even as one thread in the fabric of a much greater submission to Christ. The third, what she said perhaps grieved her the most, was how harmful she believed this verse was to her gospel witness. She said, I was offering my unbelieving friends a radical narrative of, of power inversion in which the creator God laid down his life, in which the poor outclass the rich, in which the outcasts become family. The gospel is a consuming fire of love across difference with the power to burn up racial injustice and socioeconomic exploitation. But here, she says, was this horrifying verse to promote the subjugation of women. Jesus had elevated women to an equal status with men, and Paul, it seemed to her, had pushed them back down. She says, I worried this verse would ruin my witness. She goes on to talk about how she tried to, to argue against this verse using Greek and syntax and context, but she, she couldn't explain it away no matter how hard she tries. And here's what she says. She said, then I turned my attention to the command to the husband. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? By dying on the cross, by giving himself naked and bleeding to suffer for her, by putting her needs above his own, by giving everything for her. I asked myself how I would feel if this was the command to wives. Wives, love your husband to the point of death. 
putting his needs above yours and sacrificing yourself and your rights for him. Then says Rebecca, if the gospel is true, none of us comes to the table with rights. The only way in is flat on your face. If I want to hold on to my fundamental right to self-determinism, then I must reject the message of Jesus because he calls me to submit completely to him, to deny myself and take up my cross and follow him. Almost done. Then she says, then the penny really dropped. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. This model isn't ultimately about any individual wife or husband. It's about Jesus and the church. God created sex and marriage to give us a glimpse of his intimacy with us. And this is the final sentence. should be on the screen. She says, because our marriages point to a greater marriage, the roles are not interchangeable. Jesus gives himself for us and we submit to him. Brothers and sisters, the call to model the marriage between Jesus and the church in our individual marriages, that call is difficult. And it's impossible for us to do on our own and we will fail what we're called to do. We will snap at our kids and have days where our flaws are exposed and we're not living or leading the way that God wants us to live. But do you see what she's saying in that, in, in that long quote? She's saying what seemed archaic at first, it seemed archaic until she realized that the roles in marriage are given by God not to suppress, not to oppress, but to impress. And I don't mean impress like to show off, but to impress like, like an impression of something. Okay, marriage matters because the relationship between a husband and a wife is supposed to give an impression or a reflection of the relationship between Christ and his sacrificial love for the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. In the same way, it should also be an impression and a reflection as the church we submit to Christ. Wives, Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. It's a high calling. But church, what would our marriages look like if we embraced our complementarian God-given roles? If men, knowing that our wives are made in the image of God, if we loved our wives like Jesus loved the church, not passively, not over-aggressively, and if in turn wives submitted to their God, given headship of their husband, not timidly, but boldly, what would our church look like if the marriages in our congregation looked like that? I think we'd show the Romans one world that we live in, that not only does marriage matter, but family matters. And that family matters are important because when approached with a biblical foundation, we can actually paint a portrait of God with our lives. May we be a church that embraces even the hard teachings of God because we're all living lives in submission to our King. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website at thechapel.life.